So last week, we uh, talked about romance. Um, this is our fourth week of our series in the family. And I always appreciate the feedback I got, and I got some good feedback from you last week, and you're appreciative of that. But uh, there, was, there was some criticism, and the criticism generally fell into the category of, Scott, would you tell to, uh, talk to us a little more? Tell us a little more uh, specifics about romance. I mean, we talked in sort of broad biblical principles, but what about some specifics? And so I thought we'd uh, do that. Let's take, um, let's take about the first five minutes of the message today, and let's talk a little bit about some specifics about ramping up uh, the heat in the home, ramping up the romance there. And uh, just based on my experience in our first service, let me just preface the next five minutes by saying this. Wives, will you right now tell your husband they have permission to laugh? Go ahead, because they were nervous in the first service, right? Okay, good. All right, we've got permission to laugh. With that, that being the case, let me read to you uh, how men can make women happy. How it is that uh, husbands, we can uh, do the uh, important work of making sure our wives are happy. We're going to divide it into three categories, around the house, on her birthday, and on a date. And uh, because of the way we are, men, this is divided or this is set up like a game where we can uh, uh, score points uh, or we can uh, lose points. So around the house, you make the bed, that's plus one point. You make the bed but forget to add a decorative pillow, that's zero points, right? It's nothing. They just expect that. You uh, throw the bedspread over the rumple sheets, minus one point, all right? So we kind of get how the scoring goes, right? We got that. Um, Here's another one. You check out something suspicious when you hear a noise in the middle of the night. Zero points. That's kind of expected. It's what we do. You check out a noise in the middle of the night, and it turns out to be something. That's plus two points. You check out a noise in the middle of the night. It turns out to be something, and you beat it senseless with your five iron. That's plus 10 points, unless it's her cat, and then it's minus 10 points for doing that to her cat. How about... I don't know about you. I mean, for me, uh, my wife celebrated her birthday um, last week, and so, guys, honestly, like, birthdays are fraught with peril, no? I mean, you just make sure you got to get it right. So let's take a little bit of a score of birthdays. You take her out to dinner, that's zero, because it's expected. No points for that. If you take her out to a place that's one of your favorites and they have a big screen TV there, that's minus two. If you take her out to one of your favorite places with a big screen TV and it's Monday night football night, that's minus five. And if you take her out on her birthday and it's Monday night football night at the big screen TV and the Bears are playing and you paint your face orange and blue, it's minus ten. It's no good. Now, how about this? Date night. Date night's a wonderful time. This is something we ought to be doing on a regular basis with our spouses. You take your wife to a movie, that's uh, plus two. If you take her to a movie that she likes, that's plus four. If you take her to a movie that you hate, that's plus six, especially if it's like some European movie about orphans or something like that. If you take her to a movie on a date that you like, that's minus two. And if the title of the movie you took her to is like Death Cop 9, that's minus 10. All right, we've lost that. The reality is when it comes to ramping up the romance in our house, turning up the heat in our house, what we have to do is be very sure we understand the differences between men and women, uh, women and understand what it is that helps uh, lead to those romantic times. Um, we have a video I thought you might want to watch. Women, just reiterate, it's okay to laugh. Okay, This might explain a lot about why sometimes we don't quite understand one another. It's just... There's all this pressure, you know? And sometimes it feels like it's right up on me and I can just feel it, like literally feel it in my head and it's relentless and I don't know if it's gonna stop. I mean, that's the thing that scares me most is that I don't know if it's ever gonna stop. You do have a nail in your head not about the nail. Are you sure? Because, I mean, I'll bet if we got that out of there. Stop it's... trying to fix it. No, I'm not trying to fix it. I'm just pointing out that maybe the nail is causing You always do this. You always try to fix things when what I really need is for you to just listen. See, I don't think that is what you need. I think what you need is to get the nail See, you're not listening now. Okay, fine. I will listen. Fine. It's just, sometimes it's like, there's this achy, 
and I'm not sleeping very well at all. And all my sweaters are snapped. I mean, all of them. You know the old, um, you know the old um, nursery rhyme. Maybe you uh, chanted this out on the playground back when you were a kid, right? Uh, let's use my name, my wife's name. Scott and Vicky sitting in a tree. Yeah, I N G. First comes love, then comes marriage, then comes Vicky pushing a. All right. So it's very natural then after we speak about romance last week and marriage the week before that that we're now going to take two weeks to talk about children. Those wonderful gifts that God entrusts to us. So turn to Psalm 127. Psalm 127, let's talk about our children. And I want to make sure I deliver to you a real clear truth from out of the Word of God about children. So let's get right to it. It's this. Our children have value. Treasure them. Our children have value. Treasure them. Recognize when God brings children into our home, that is a very valuable commodity he has entrusted to our care. And in Psalm 127, it's one of those psalms, it's one of those texts that I get to read all the time, hundreds of times I've read this, to those who have just welcomed children into the home or I'm at the hospital reading that. Love that. Look at verses 3, 4, and 5, Psalm 127. It's going to use three terms to speak of the value of that our children have within the home. Behold, let me have your attention. Listen, we would say, look, behold, children are a, here's the first word, a heritage from the Lord. It's something given at birth. It's a birthright. Children are a heritage from the Lord. The fruit of the womb, here's the second word, a reward. Uh, this speaks of value, high value. They're highly prized, the reward. Like arrows, there's the third word. This speaks to purpose. So they're a heritage from the Lord is their source. They're like a reward that is their value. And then their purpose is like arrows in the hand of a warrior are children's of one, uh, children of one's youth. Verse 5, blessed is the man who fills his quiver with them. He shall not be put to shame when he speaks with his enemy in the gate. Three words, heritage, their source, there is a reward, their value, and then they're like arrows, which is their purpose. And honestly, we kind of get the, uh, the uh, value in the arrows. The one that was hardest for me this week as I'm preparing was the issue of heritage. Now, it shouldn't be hard. Heritage is not a hard word. It simply means something we receive upon our birth. For example, if you were born in America as a citizen, we have the heritage of freedom. Not as much as we used to have, but we still have a heritage of freedom. We get to vote for officials, all right? Uh, or if you emigrated, you came to America, you have a heritage passed along from one generation to the next of freedom. So I'm looking at that and saying, well, how are kids a heritage? I don't understand. What, like, what does that mean? And I actually had to do some work in the original language. It's been a long time since I've done that. But let me see if I can help you get the the mystery resolved like I did this week, and it's when we literally read through what it says. So listen to this kind of literal translation of this. A heritage of Jehovah, that's God's covenant name, or Yahweh, um, a heritage of Jehovah are children. That cleared it up for me. The emphasis is not that they're a heritage. The emphasis is that they're from God. The value of our children is not simply that they're ours. Well, that's certainly true, and they're certainly in the image of God. The value of our children is the fact that they are from God himself. So, for example, I have in my hand here a little a stopwatch. It's a gold-plated stopwatch. It's old, and as you will notice here, uh, the ring on the top that would uh, hold the chain is gone, and um, <laughs> the hinge is broken. And uh, I did this myself. I broke this. The crystal on the front is broken. And so in reality, there's probably very little value in this um, piece of gold-plated 
watch because it just it doesn't work. It's, it's sort of broken up. It's got some scratches on it. The value to this wa- uh, of this watch to me, and it is very valuable to me, is found on the front cover where barely you can see anymore because it's been so used and scraped up is a letter engraved. What letter do you think it is? It's an N for nickels. The reason why this watch has value to me is not because inherently it's a really, really valuable watch. It has value to me because my father gave it to me with his name on it, or our family name, as he received it from his father a generation prior to that with the family name on it. Like this watch, our children have value not just because they're specially created in God's image, but primarily because our children come from a loving father who has entrusted them to us as a heritage for this generation. Recognize when God brings children into the home, that child has great value. This may be one of the great keys of parenting. Parenting recognizes what we've got with that little baby. Parenting recognizes what we've got as that child begins to grow. That this is a valuable heritage, gift, a passing along one generation to the next of something that has value because it is from a father who loves us and we get to train and pass that along to the next generation. There is reward there. We get that. And then the issue of arrows. Now, I love this concept of an arrow because it's a little fresh. We probably don't think in terms of arrows too much. In the first service, we had some hunters that were here for that first service. And so when I said, what's the purpose of an arrow? We were like, I don't know. They're all like, to shoot. Arrows are designed to be launched. And arrows are designed to make an impact. That brings us to the second thing out of Psalm chapter 127 that we have, and it's this. Our children have purpose. We must prepare them. Not only do our children have value, they have purpose. In other words, when God gave us these children, he gave us for them uh, to us, he gave them to us for a reason. And it is that we can then shape them like you would shape an arrow. We can shape them and fit them to launch them so that they are designed to make an impact. Psalm 127 says, their arrows, listen, in the hand of a warrior. They're not arrows designed to forever stay in the quiver or the bag. They are to be taken out, they are to be shaped, they are to be aimed, so that ultimately when they're mature enough, they are launched, and into their adulthood, they make an impact for what God has called them to be and to do. That's part of their value. And if you and I, if you and I are going to be effective as parents, we have to be able to answer the question, how can I know how to fit them, how to draw back the bow, and how can I know where to launch them? That's a great question. In fact, maybe one of the great secrets, if you can call it that, or one of the great truths of parenting, and it's this, I must know my child. If I'm going to recognize that my child was born on a purpose and for a purpose, and my child is designed like an arrow to be launched so that in time they make an impact, I've got to recognize I've got to know my child. Now, with that thought in mind, take a look to the right in your Bible, to Proverbs chapter 22. Look at Proverbs chapter 22. We get to Proverbs chapter 22, and we're going to look at verse 6, which may be one of the most familiar Proverbs there is. Proverbs 22 and verse 6 says this. Train up a child in the way he should go. Even when he is old, he will not depart from it. Now, question. Have you heard of this proverb before? How many? Raise a hand. Yeah, I mean, the vast majority. The same thing, first service. Second question. How many of you had this proverb explained to you something like this? Train up a child in the way he should go means I should get them to Sunday school or I should get them to religious education. I should make sure they're baptized. I should teach them well. And then when they're old, even though they're probably going to wander away, they'll come back to it. You ever hear it explained that way? Yeah, quite a few of us have. Let me just say this, that's wrong. (laughs) I'm not saying that doesn't happen. That happens a lot, but that's not what this verse is promising. Let's see if we can kind of walk through what exactly it means to know our child based on this verse. First of all, train up a child. Great word. It's a very descriptive word. It's to take a sour mash of the date plant and to rub it on the lips of a newborn for the purpose of that newborn going, 
and begin that sucking process to desire some kind of nourishment. We, as we're training our children, are supposed to create the kind of environment that says they desire to go in a way. And look at what it says. Train up a child in the way, what? He should go. Train up a child in the way he should go. Whose way? God's way. No, it's not that. That's not what the verse says. Train up a child in the way he, what's the antecedent of he? Think about it. The child should go. In fact, literally it says this. Train up a child, create a hunger, a desire. Train up a child according to his way. Now that means at least two things. One, specifically what is appropriate for the age of the child. So that we handle our two-year-olds very differently than we handle our our 12-year-olds or our 22-year-olds. Uh, Don't worry too much when they're two about what they'll be like when they're 12. Deal with the two-year-old, and you'll be equipped to deal with the 12-year-old. And uh, as we're learning, equip God willing to deal with the 22-year-old in the home. So train up a child according to their way. But there's something more clear than that and probably more fundamental. We kind of get, I think, that I treat a 2-year-old or a 12-year-old or a 20-year-old differently. What we might not get is the other sense of this word, which is... Train up a child according to his way, meaning the way that his bent is, the way that God has created him uniquely to be. So you may have a child that's very gifted athletically. You would train him up according to that. You may have a child that is really good with the books. They just hit the books, right? They, you don't have to talk to them about it. They're doing homework. They're very, very responsible like that. Now, I know none of you have kids like that, but I've heard they have, there are kids like that in the world. Okay, well, let's get them going down that path. Other kids love drama. Other kids love acting. Other kids love music. Other kids love, I mean, pick it, right? There's a hundred different ways they could go. Part of effective parenting is this. I know the way they should go, and I create an environment that creates desire to go that way. Then when they're old and they're firmly ensconced in this way, they don't depart from it. I'm not saying don't bring them to church. Of course we bring our kids to church. We're always required to rear our children in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. But within that broad framework of what does it mean to rear a child in the discipline and instruction of the Lord, we as wise parents say, I know this child. He is this kind of a child. She is this kind of a child. Uh, They are those kinds of kids. And therefore, I am prudent about saying according to their way. If you ever have a child, don't raise your hand because maybe your, maybe your kids will do this or, or no, they're here. If you ever have a child, you just say a word, a stern word, and they just they melt. Very moldable. Uh, you have other children, you could strap them in and threaten to kill them, and they are not going to listen to you. Uh, by the way, I don't suggest you do that, but I mean, we recognize our kids are very different. They're very unique. We need to shape them, and and a lot more about that next week, next week's message about fences. We need to shape uh, shape them differently. So the parent that says, I'm going to treat all of my children alike, that's a bad plan. Our children aren't all alike. Newsflash. So I experienced this over the last four or five months. Uh, We love to do projects around the house. When I say we, I mean I make the mess, and my wife very graciously cleans up those messes a lot of times. But uh, we had hardwood. This was the project, hardwood flooring back in May. Now, I'm even smart enough to realize I can't, that's a very skilled thing. And so we uh, farmed that out and hired a guy to come in and do the hardwood. But I thought I can still do something and be useful. I'll do all the trim because they have to take off the trim and we'll put back new trim. And and Vicki and I talked about, you know, uh, the nicer trim and this and that. And so uh, we're doing it. That's May, right? July, August, September, October. Trim is not back down. Here, now, I didn't say I haven't tried. I have a wonderful tool. I got to be able to buy that, a compound miter saw. That's a wonderful thing, guys. You do projects around the house. Great excuse to buy tools. And I bought lots and lots of trim. In fact, there's lots of cut pieces of scrap trim in my garage right now. Um, I painted it. I I primed it. I painted it. got it all set. Here was the problem. I'm going along fine when it's straight with no edges. I can do that trim. In fact, there are a few pieces like that in there. But when you get to outside corners, and outside corner is like, 
you know, like this here, where you got to put them together. Wow. If anything will make a pastor curse, it could be doing outside corners. And I spent a lot of time highly agitated and frustrated because I tried, set the saw on 45, cut it nice and straight and square, and put that outside corner. And you know what my outside corners look like? They look like that. Or some look like that. Some look like that. No amount of filling, no amount of paint and caulk could fix it. It was a mess. Very aggravated. You know what I eventually found out? The problem, and you woodworkers are already laughing because you know, Ed, I know you're a finished carpenter for about 50 years, but the problem wasn't with the trim. I bought a you know, nice grade of, of trim, and the problem wasn't on the saw blade. You know, you got to buy a new saw blade for a project like that. And really, honestly, the problem wasn't even me cutting straight. With the saw blade and the tool, I could cut straight. You know what the problem was? I was approaching it all wrong. I was trying so hard to make the cuts just right so that that trim perfectly met. The one Take into consideration was what? The wall, <laughs> where the trim goes. You see, even though our house isn't that old, we have uh, isn't that old, we have exactly zero straight walls in our house. None of those outside corners are exactly square. Put on top of that, this hardwood followed the contour of what's under, and it's a little bit like this, too, a little wavy. So I have learned that the secret of getting that outside corner straight is to just cut back a little bit there. Put it out, relax, doesn't fit the first time, cut back a little bit more there, and begin to conform the trim to match the wall. Listen, parents, we will save ourselves a ton of frustration in life if we will stop and look and say, you know what, with this child, that wall's a little crooked there, that floor is a little uneven there, and the best way to equip and shape this child to get the right fit is to study the child, not spend more time out in the garage on the tools. Parents make a study, take the time to know your child. When we do, we recognize uh, those things. When we do, it fits a whole lot better. I'm not saying there's still not conflict. Of course, there is. Healthy families always have conflict, but it fits. It raises up a child in the way that they should go. In fact, I'd ask us three questions. Can we answer these questions about our children? One, do we know what they're good at? Have I observed long enough and deeply enough and clearly enough, I know my child is good at this or has the potential to be good at this? Proverbs says that even a child is known by his actions. Watch. A second, do we know what our child is afraid of? Do we recognize where they sort of avoid those situations? Maybe that's an area to spend a little time thinking about why. Third, do we know where our child fits? Good at this, they're afraid of that, and the fit is there. So many parents create so much frustration, hammering over and over and over on a round peg into a square hole. Peg doesn't like it, square hole doesn't like it, and the hammer gets tired. <laughs> Study. Know our children, and then rear them according to their way. Now, you all know Emmanuel Estrada. Emmanuel, come on up here. Emmanuel's been with us for seven months now, uh, seven weeks now, I should say. And uh, yeah, it's a long time, right? And Emmanuel, I'm trying to know Emmanuel a little bit here. And uh, Emmanuel um, is uh, going to be pastoring down in New Lenox ultimately when that church is ready to relaunch. But for now, he's spending a lot of time here. And we were working on this earlier this week, and Emmanuel told me a story. It's really a very good story about some very hard work his parents did to know him and to equip him. Now, Emmanuel, you uh, emigrated to the States when you were younger. Yep. You grew up in Romania. Yep. Tell us a little bit about some of the challenges that come with that happening and how your parents handled that. Sure, sure. Um, so, uh, as some of you might know, my family and I are originally from Romania. Uh, and uh, in the summer of 1992, uh, my parents decided that they had enough of... Uh, uh, communist Romania, so we immigrated to the States. On July 4th, 1992, we touched down in New York City, leaving behind the hopeless uh, and really gloomy uh, future that existed in communist Romania for a bright uh, and hopeful future here in the United States. Um, we moved to a little town called Paradise in California, and so it was that, a that's, that's a pretty nice <laughs> move. Romania, Paradise. Absolutely. That'll so work. smart parents. Um, so what my parents did 
as soon as we got to the States was they knew that both my siblings and I and then and then they didn't know the language. They didn't know English. They didn't know the culture. So what they did is they uh, enrolled themselves in a community college so that they might be able to learn the language, understand the culture that they were sending their kids into. Uh, and so my mother and I spent countless nights going over spelling words and vocabulary, um, making sure we knew the dif- the difference between those really difficult words like kitchen and chicken, so I don't go to school saying I had a kitchen for dinner. Um, and, but my parents knew my siblings and I. My older, uh, my older sisters, very dedicated. They were the kind of girls you know, that hit the books. Me, not so much. I wanted to play outside. But my mother and father spent a lot of time just working with me, doing homework together, preparing and saying, okay, we know Emmanuel isn't really great at academics. Uh, just making sure that, that uh, they spent a lot of time pouring into me. Now, I had many friends who were also Romanian, and we all kind of lived in a Romanian community. Uh, and their parents, they worked two jobs, making sure that they, they would have nice toys, new clothes, and had a nicer uh, home to live in. And what happened as a result was these, uh, these kids would come home and start using foul language around the home. Now, mom and dad, not knowing the language, didn't know what was happening until it was too late. Um, and what I really appreciated, and as I look back, admire my parents understand the importance of knowing their children, knowing where they're sending their children to, understanding this concept uh, and this principle of sending the arrows into, uh, into the world to make an impact, to have an impact, and knowing that that meant that they would spend time to know their kids uh, and understand where they're sending their kids into. Good, so, thanks, man. I yeah, appreciate thank you. that. Yep. So we've got the job... We've got the job of knowing our children and then learning that. And Emmanuel told me, too, that, you know, some of these kids would speak just foul right to their parents, but their parents didn't know. And, uh, you know, it's, it's clear that we don't always speak our kids' language, but in this case, it was literally true. Take a look at Genesis. Go back to the left in your Bible, to Genesis 25. I just want us to see this. I want to hammer this nail one last time, this issue of knowing our children, because they're uniquely created. This is not a modern idea. It's not some pop culture idea that our kids are unique and therefore we should treat them according to their way. Genesis 25 is a terrific, terrific love story of Isaac and Rebecca. And they are married, and they're married for 20 years before they have children. And through a lot of prayer and God's grace, they eventually have kids. And the very first time out, they have twins. So it's like bonus baby type thing. And look at Genesis chapter 25, verse 24. All right, Genesis 25. Verse 24, speaking of Rebekah, when her days to give birth were completed, behold, there were twins in her womb. The first came out red, his body all hairy like a cloak. Stop for a minute. Wow. Hairy and red. Not the most beautiful baby ever, probably. And so these are very um, not creative names. So they called his name Esau, which means red. Genius. Uh, Verse 26, afterwards his brother came out with his hand holding Esau's heel, so they called him Jacob, which means heel grabber. These guys are on a roll. We've got red and heel grabber. Now the problem with heel grabber is really what that means is someone who trips or cheats. The idea being that this guy will trip up whoever he has to to be able to win the race. Boy, would that ever come true later in life. But look at... Verse 27 and 28. Okay, now keep in mind, we're talking twins. Same mother, same father, same delivery, and look at this. When the boys grew up, Esau was a skillful hunter, a man of the field, all right? Here's the guy that grows the long beard, wears the checkered shirt, and has his bow and arrow and is out hunting for three days. Okay, this is the guy. This is Esau. Yo, my name's Red. Okay, Red, what'd you get? Man, I got a deer and I got a gazelle. And Okay, perfect. Look at the next turn of phrase. Uh, And look at verse, uh, yeah, 27. Um, The boys grew up, he was a skillful hunter of the field. While Jacob was a, what's your translation say? Yeah, a quiet man. King James says, a smooth man. Jacob preferred, in fact, to stay in the home. He was a smooth man or a quiet man dwelling in tents. 
What we'll find out later is that Jacob had a real gift for administration. He actually ran dad's business. Esau went out, hunted stuff down, and brought it back home to eat. Now, they're very different. They're twins and born at the same time of the same mother and father and totally different. Different hair color, different skin tone, different interests in life. Look at the problem begins to crop up, verse 34. I'm sorry, verse 28. Isaac loved red because he ate of his game. But Rebekah loved the heel grabber, probably because he helped out around the house and was managing the business interest. Here's the problem. Sometimes we recognize our children's uniqueness. We just don't value it. I said treat children differently. I didn't say treat them unfairly. Part of parenting then is not only, it's not only knowing, but then acting appropriately for that. To know our child, to be able to guide and direct our child as they go forward in life. Brings me to the third thing, I would say, and it's this. Children bring great reward. Enjoy them. And enjoy them. I mean, I understand, at least I understand up until about age uh, 21, I understand the challenges that come with parenting. And they are many. But we've got to be able to step back from that and say, thank God I have these children. Unique as they are, frustrating as they can be, I thank God for giving me these children. Now, take your Bible, if you're uh, all the way back in Genesis, look back in the Psalms, Psalm 139. I just want to take a moment to point this out, because here's a great gift we can pass along to these unique children God has given us. Psalm 139. We're saying that children have value because they're from God. We're saying that as parents, part of our job is to know them and understand and release that value, because like arrows, they're to be launched. How can I do that? Look at Psalm 139, especially beginning in verse 13. Here's a writer saying, I want to thank God for the way I was formed and created, from conception to birth to growing, for you, speaking of the Lord, for you formed my inward parts. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. How about that? That God superintends. We're not just the result of biology. Somebody doesn't just win the dice throw with how their kids turn out. God is superintending both through conception and through development in the womb how that child is designed. Verse 14, I praise you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows it full well. Stop. Do our kids know that? Have we delivered to them the truth You can praise God for how you are made as you are. If we spend all of our time trying to change how God made them, we're going to undercut the truth that God designed them especially for his use. Parents, we train them according to their way. I'm not talking about moral issues. I'm not talking about biblical issues. I'm saying just the common sense in life. This is a design. This is the target for which they are headed Follow in that way. Give our our kids the tremendous gift of them being able to thank God for who they are and how they were formed. Verse 15. uh, Look look at the end of verse 14. Wonderful are your works. Referencing God's work in conception and creation. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows it full well or very well. I come to a place of recognizing God made me this way, and I am glad for that. Parents, I come to a place of recognizing my God created the temperament, the skills, the desires of my child, and I can affirm that. I can get them going down the path according to their way. Verse 16 just speaks of the intimate knowledge of God. Your eyes saw my unformed substance. In your book were written, every one of them, the days that were formed for me, when as yet there were none of them. So that God looks down the corridor of history and says, I've designed this one for that impact at that target. And parents, we don't know the future perfectly. We never will. But uh, using the knowledge we have of knowing our child, recognizing the path that they should go, we can give them a long lift towards that impact when we spend more time listening and learning and equipping them for that than fighting the way God's made them. Now back in Psalm 127, let's wrap it up with the reward. 
Because this psalm ends on a terrific note. In fact, this psalm continues, Psalm 128, to even talk about the value of grandparenting. But let's just finish at Psalm 127, verse 5. Blessed is the man who fills his quiver with them. Children are a gift, and the more the merrier is what he's saying. Look at the verse, at the end of verse 5. He, that is the father, shall not be put to shame when he speaks with his enemies in the gate. Meaning there comes a time into their adulthood when we as parents take rightful pride as they publicly, they publicly declare themselves as our children. In the gate, the place of public business transaction. This is a high school graduation. This is a college graduation. This is getting started in life. And as parents, we say, I'm not ashamed of that. I'm proud of that. That's the fruit of many years of knowing and treasuring and shaping my child. Now, before we wrap up this particular message, I just want to take a couple of minutes. I think it's important to be very honest. All of us have made mistakes as parents. And all God's people say, there are no perfect parents just as there are no perfect children. But maybe some of you are here and you're saying, Scott, my heart's a little heavy because I wish I would have known this 30 years ago. I, maybe I made some mistakes. Maybe my children have turned out in ways that at times break my heart. I want to, I want to address that. Um, for some, you say, well, it's too late. Hear me, it's not too late. We, we face choices. Even if our children are in a very bad place, here's the choice as parents we face. I can live with regret and shut down and live in self-pity, and many do. Or I can lean into that and say, I may have fallen short before, but I understand now the power of God's gift to me and children. And as much as I am capable of doing from this time forward, I am going to respect and honor and love my child for who God made that child to be. I may, I may need to make a phone call or even better, have a personal conversation and say, honey, here's some places dad or mom fell short. I want you to understand how much I love you, how much I thank God for you, and I am for you moving forward. I would not spend one day, I would not spend one hour in regret. I would continually turn those children over to the Lord, asking God to call them back to himself, and I would do everything in my power to help affirm my love for that child. And by the way, grandparents... What a tremendous gift. Just look at Psalm 128. You want to see about the power of grandparenting. We can lean, well, when I'm a grandparent one day, a few years from now, hopefully. Um, when we lean into that as grandparents, we can have a tremendous influence, not only on the next generation, but the one beyond that. So we live with that. When I think of the value of parenting, I think of the power of that. I think of a story of a mother and son who were pretty close. Some have actually criticized the mother for being a little overbearing, but the son loved her. Her name uh, was Sarah. Uh, his name was Frankie. And uh, Sarah really sort of helped Frankie as he went through some things in life, some tough things in life, actually very hard things in life. And there came a time Frankie got married. He had six children. And uh, he had the opportunity to apply for a job. And it was a job that would have brought him pretty good fame, but the income wasn't great. In fact, he was going to make less money than he was making currently what he was doing. He was a stockbroker and an attorney. And um, he wrote and he sought some advice. I don't know. Should I apply for this job? He was in the running for the job. He just didn't know for sure if he wanted to sit down and go through all the process. So um, he actually sought advice, and his mother wrote him a letter. It's a great letter. She said, son, I know you can do this. I think you should pursue the job. Now, she followed up with something you and I can't do. Well, at least I can't do. She said, and I'll make up the difference in your salary. I'll just kind of, you know, under the table, I'll give you this money. And then she wrote this at the bottom. P.S., destroy this letter. <laughs> Which, of course, since we know, we have. She, uh, he didn't do that. But that was how Frank Delano Roosevelt decided he would run for the governorship and for the presidency of the United States. Because his mother, Sarah Roosevelt, said, son, you can do this. And I'll help make it up to you, right? I mean, who could live on a president's salary anyway, right? My point is, Sarah, as a mother and in a grandmother of many kids, had great delight in what her son turned out to be, and she saw in him that potential. Parents, let's do that. Let's see in our children that great value God has given and begin to launch them according to their way so that they make the impact God has intended for. Let me pray. I want to pray over our families here today and for our children and parents. Join me in that. Let's do that.
Father, I pray for moms and dads here. Pray for those young parents. God, give them grace and strength. Help them to learn these early years, learn just how their kids are, how they're put together, how you design them, to, to discern, Lord, what it is down the road will be that impact. Provide the safety and security of allowing them to develop as you intended. And then, Father, I also pray for those who have older kids, the teenage years, the 20s, Lord, that they would be patient and loving and encouraging and strong when needed, Father, to be able to guide and direct those kids as they get much nearer to making that impact. Lord, for those who have children that are grown, some of whom perhaps are not following after you, God, that you would draw them back. And I pray that parents would rest in your grace. Father, forgive us as parents for the faults we all have. Help us to be wise, whatever season of life we find ourselves in. Help us to be wise in parenting these wonderful treasures you've given to us, or grandparenting. Father, I pray we would model for them the kind of love you have for us, creating us uniquely, designing us for impact, and leading us along the way. Father, thank you for our children. We ask this in your son Jesus' name. Amen.